to introduce our uh, welcome, Martin Weir, an old friend of ours from uh, back in the day, very old days, I think I see what I say, Martin. But anyway, Martin Weir is taking our service this morning. Thank you very much. Made a mistake. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Never. 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 Sorry, never was the word I used. Yeah, never. Never. Yes. I guess we all make mistakes. Some are quite trivial. Some are quite far-reaching. Have lots of consequences for ourselves and for those around us. And when we make mistakes, we have different ways of dealing with it, as we see quite clearly from the media. And this is not intended to be topical at all. <laughs> Some of us will put our hands up and go, yeah, sorry, got that wrong. Do something differently, do it differently next time. Some of us will kind of just bury our heads in the sand and have it all go away and we'll all move on. And some of us will struggle, in a way, perhaps to live with whatever it is. I mean, you know, depending on what it is we're talking about, the kind of mistakes, the kind of things that we do, the way that we reflect on them. Now, today, we're thinking about Jesus coming to meet Peter and the disciples at the lakeside. That's the lectionary that is set for today. And we... I'm sure all know Peter's story. Peter had let down Jesus. He had denied knowing him at the, when they stood around the fire in the high priest's courtyard in those hours before Jesus was tried and crucified. I wonder what he felt like afterwards. And so we then come to we step forward a few weeks and we come to this scene on the lakeside, which we're going to hear about as we progress through the service today, where Jesus appears to Peter and the disciples. And what does he do? Does he go, you made a mistake, mate. I'm going to cancel you. That's the word that we use, the... the, the Young people use these days about saying that, you know, I don't, don't agree with you anymore. I'm not going to listen to you. I don't want to know you. Stay away from me. Jesus' reaction is entirely opposite <coughs> to that. And I think that we can draw a lot of comfort from that because we are frail human beings. We make mistakes. We do things we shouldn't do. That's why we offer that prayer of forgiveness, confession, at the beginning of our worship. Yet this story of Jesus and Peter reminds us how much God continues to love us and he wants us to follow him and he's willing to, I won't say overlook what we do, but he's willing to forgive us and to enable us to move on. And that's something, I think, that we should be thankful for. So we're now going to share in a prayer of thanksgiving drawn from this story. So let us pray. We praise you, living God, that when the nets of our lives are empty, you fill them with the abundance of your love. When we are afraid and fall down, you hold out your hand of forgiveness. And when we are tempted to give up, you call us afresh and give us new strength for our journey. And so we thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to continue that thankful theme as we sing our next hymn, which is number 78 in Singing the Faith, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. <coughs>
set for today in a moment. And Margaret's going to read from Psalm 30, and Barbara's going to read from John chapter 21. The, the Psalm, Psalm 30, was composed for the dedication of the temple. And it contrasts the experience, the good news of God's divine mercy with the challenges of ordinary human existence and experience. And the psalmist gives examples out of the depths of his own experience and the way that God has drawn him out and so enables the psalmist to praise God. And that reading will help to frame the Gospel reading, the story of Jesus' restoration of Peter on the shores of Lake Galilee. Extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up, and did not let my fo foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favour is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favour, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. St John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, <clears throat> the net was not torn. 
Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. <coughs> Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. love is this that gave itself for me. We sing hymn number 286.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. You have changed my sadness into a joyful dance. You have taken away my sorrow and surrounded me with joy. So I will not be silent. I will sing praise to you. Lord, you are my God. I will give you thanks forever. Verses 11 and 12 of Psalm 30. As we read the story of Jesus' restoration of Peter again today in such challenging times, I think that we can all draw encouragement, huge encouragement, from the events on the shore of Lake Galilee. For at its heart, it's a story about second chances and about new beginnings. And whether we're bewildered by the events of the world that are going on around us, or struggling with our own issues and inadequacies, all of which can leave us feeling rather helpless and confused, then here is some encouragement in the way that Jesus reaches out to his disciples and to Peter in particular, and he reaches out to us. I really like this story of the lakeside. I think it starts with the situation. Some of us went there in 2013 when we were on a pilgrimage in the Holy Land when we stood on the shores of Lake Galilee where this event happened. But actually, we could all, in our mind's eye, picture this kind of scene. It's a cool early morning. The mist is rising, perhaps, on the lake. The water's lapping onto the beach. The boats are out fishing. There's a fire burning, cooking some fish. Hmm, how we've missed going on holiday. <laughs> For St John, this story has huge significance in the lives of the disciples and in the growth and the spread of the church as Jesus' earthly ministry was coming to its close. <coughs> and it can offer us encouragement too, as we try to live in our world, in God's world, as his disciples in these challenging times. This is a story of recognition, of restoration, leading to commission. And underpinning all of it is encouragement. And who can't do with a bit of encouragement every now and then? <coughs> Recognition. The disciples had gone back to fishing. They'd gone back to what they knew. They'd gone back to familiarity. Perhaps that was the way that they were coping with what was going on in their minds and their lives. They'd gone out at night to fish. But they caught nothing. You can imagine they were tired, they were irritable, they were hungry, they were generally grumpy, like I am at some times of the day. And there's this bloke on the beach. They don't know who he is, but he, he's giving them advice. Oh, don't you just love getting advice from other people when things aren't quite going the way you think they should do? Put your nets out on the other side, he says. <coughs> And for some reason, they do. They don't tell him where to go. And they catch a lot of fish. 153, the Gospel says, which I think is just a number to tell us that it's a lot. <coughs> and suddenly, their eyes are opened. They recognise the man on the beach. And that recognition galvanises them into action. Peter grabs his clothes and he's off the boat in a flash and the others no doubt following on behind him. And they drag this catch ashore, and they share 
their couch with Jesus and they have breakfast together with their dearest friend. And that meal reshapes their fellowship. They were restored as disciples who were then going to carry forward the good news of Jesus to the world. And very specifically, Jesus calls Peter aside, makes him face up to what he had been living with for some time, and delves into kind of the depths, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but delves into the depths of, of, of what he was feeling and draws that out, and then forgives him and commissions him. And that's it, that's the next stage after the restoration is the commission. Feed my sheep, be a leader of these disciples, be ready to share the good news when I'm no longer with you. And then there's that final command to all of them, follow me. And underpinning it all you can imagine is this aura of encouragement that despite everything, Jesus believes in these chaps and in Peter especially. What a scene that must have been for them. <coughs> and for me, for us this morning, I'm going to offer you three things that this might help us with in these difficult times. The first is this, that it reminds us how abundantly God loves us. How abundantly God loves us. I can imagine Peter identifying with Psalm 30 because it speaks of someone who praises God because God had become real to him and loved him despite his failings. The psalmist tells us through the words that he was desperate. He was crying out for help when God restored his life. Perhaps he'd done something wrong, something that he'd regretted. Something that he thought deserved the anger of God. But he says in those his words that God's anger is momentary, but his goodness lasts a lifetime because his goodness is built on steadfast love. So I'm not going to be silent, says the psalmist. I will sing praise to you, O Lord, for you are my God. I will give you thanks forever. The abundant love of God has been demonstrated supremely in the death and resurrection of Jesus, where his actions show just how much we are loved and accepted by God, despite everything, as the words of that hymn that we've just sung remind us. And this abundant love is demonstrated again in this encounter between Jesus and his disciples. It's a love which recognises, amongst other things, the deep needs of those disciples who'd returned to their roots in search for stability. It's a love that recognises and offers forgiveness. It's a love that gives a fresh start to Peter and a new challenge. As I said earlier, we can only speculate on what Peter might have been going through since that betrayal in the high priest's house. Jesus doesn't condemn Peter for it. He knows Peter's heart, his contrition. There's no blame. Jesus only sees the potential of Peter to be the rock, the solid foundation of his church. But it's not an easy love that Peter is offered. When they talk, Jesus searches him out. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? Jesus looked deeply into Peter's soul. Yes, was Peter's response, I do. The words of Psalm 30 could have been Peter's response to this abundant love that he'd experienced. You've changed my sadness into a joyful dance. You've taken away my sorrow. You've surrounded me with joy, so I'll not be silent. I will sing praise to you. Lord, you are my God. I will give you thanks forever. And it could be ours too. 
For we too are loved abundantly. Maybe we're not always aware of it. Maybe there are times when we think we don't need it. We're okay on our own. Maybe we think we don't deserve it. Nevertheless, that love is always there. Always offered freely. Always longing for a response. God loves abundantly. Then and now. His love is constant. It doesn't count the cost. And it will carry us on, just as it carried on those disciples. God loves abundantly. The second thing is that the story talk, it reminds us that discipleship is about moving on. Now I've preached a few sermons over the Easter period over the years, and I'm struck by a consistent theme, or maybe I'm just getting very repetitive, that I'm always talking about moving on. Because that's what this is all about. It's not about standing still, it's about moving on. Now, I don't know whether you've ever been gobsmacked. Uh, it's kind of a great word, I think, that gobsmacked. S stopped in your tracks by a feeling of incredulity, awe, and wonder. When something maybe unexpected we, we experience. And it can be a kind of accompanied by the feeling of, well, what do I do now? What do I do next? as you stand there with your jaw dropped. No doubt those disciples at the lakeside, Peter included, were gobsmacked at the appearance of Jesus and the way that they talked and he talked to them. Perhaps they struggled with what to do next, but Jesus has the words for them. Two of them, follow me. Jesus accepted that the disciples had returned to their roots for stability and support. He knew that Peter needed forgiveness. But he also needed them to move on, to move on as people, to move on to lives of mission and service, to be energised by God's love, to be eager to share that experience with others. So he's encouraging them to keep at it, to see how what they can offer, combined with what he gives to them, will enable them to achieve so much in God's service. Isn't it interesting how God entrusts leadership to Peter with all of his frailties and weaknesses? Maybe Jesus felt that failure made Peter a better pastor. Who knows? We may have to face our own shortcomings and failures with honesty, but the risen Jesus will meet us exactly where we are. And he takes what we can offer. He starts where he finds us, if we offer what we can, poor as it may seem. He doesn't expect perfection, but he knows what we are capable of, more perhaps than we think we are capable of. We often talk about discipleship as a journey, a journey where the route may be unclear and difficult, but it's one that we need to make. And in the company of Jesus, it's one we make being encouraged every day. So the lakeside reminds us that God loves us abundantly. And it also reminds us about the need to be moving on. And finally, the story is about what can happen when he works with us when the divine touches the ordinary, or we fish on the right side, as we might say. Fishing on the right side, when the divine touches the ordinary. There are many times where we might describe as ordinary, are touched with the divine and reveal the wonder of God to us. Some of these are much more obvious than others. I remember, not that long ago, well, it must be a few years ago now, standing on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, watching the snow settle as the sun set. Now, that was just sublime. And it reminded me, it brought to mind the glory of God's creation in a moment. Maybe listening to a sublime piece of music, sharing a friendship, 
looking after someone. There are so many ordinary and extraordinary life experiences that are revelations of the goodness of God and provide inspiration and strength in the recognition of the divine. The lake side is an illustration of what happens when the divine comes into contact with the ordinary, when the abundant love of God touches the lives of ordinary people, forging an awesome partnership. The disciples had gone back to fishing, into which Jesus' reappearance brings the amazing back into their ordinary lives. When he joins them on the beach, he's not seeking to condemn or complain, but he wants to help them, to catch fish, to help each other, to catch his vision. On the fish catching front, they're very successful. And when, once they start to fish in the right place, fishing on the right side is when they allowed their ordinary lives to be touched again by the extraordinary Jesus. And it changes them. From then on, Jesus is a part of every aspect of their lives. So that the ordinary and the amazing, the sacred and the secular become interwoven. And their witness grows from strength to strength. Our faith is largely lived out in the ordinary daily lives that we lead. And in the context of what goes on around those lives. What encourages us is that, as for the disciples, Jesus can inform and illuminate our living so that we take the goodness of God wherever we go, so that we become the way that the divine comes into contract with the ordinary. So I ask you a question. How well do we allow the divine to mesh with the ordinary in our lives? That's one for you to chew over, over your roast beef or whatever it is. How well do we allow the divine to mesh with the ordinary in our lives? Are we continuing to fish on the left side of the boat because that's the way we've always done it and that's the way we feel comfortable? Or can we fish on the right side and experience that our ordinary lives can be touched by and reveal the divine at work. The choice is ours. And then perhaps we can say with the psalmist, you have changed my sadness into a joyful dance. You've taken away my sorrow and surrounded me with joy. So I won't be silent. I will sing praise to you, Lord, for you are my God. I will give you thanks forever. Amen. And so we sing our next hymn. We, have you heard God's voice? Has your heart been stirred? Are you still prepared to follow? Number 662 in Singing the Faith.
turn now to our prayers of intercession, uh, to which there is in which there is a response. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came in humility to show us what love is really like. Thank you for the example you have given us. Teach us how to love like you do. And so we pray for all those we are called upon to love. Our families, friends, colleagues and neighbours. Remembering those in special need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in our world who are downtrodden, forgotten, unloved and homeless. We pray for refugees and for all those fleeing pain, war or persecution, thinking particularly of the people of Ukraine, but acknowledging there are also other places across the world where refugees are fleeing. We pray for those who face up to the challenges of living day to day with poverty, with illness, with broken relationships. May they all know you, especially close to them this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. As we remember that you came in humility, we pray for the world's leaders and rulers in our current very difficult times. We ask you to give them humility and wisdom. Give them listening ears, open hearts and a deep desire for justice and to put others first. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, go ahead of us this week into all that we do. We think now of the places where we know we are going and the people we may meet and ask you to be there with us in whatever circumstances we may face. And as we walk with you, help us to learn something new about you that will spur us on to a deeper relationship with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we say together the Lord's Prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and ever. given here on this place and gifts which are given in 19. Christ triumphant ever reigning.
always work in progress. Keep before us the vision of heaven on earth. Show us the way of life that is the pattern of Christ. Fill our hearts with the hope and promise of your ongoing work of transformation in our lives, now and every day. Amen. Amen. And we close by saying the words of the grace to each other. The grace, the grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, evermore. Amen.